Oh my goodness. Good morning, everybody. That was kind of a weak one, huh? It's Chris. Welcome. It's good to see you. It's like having a it's like having a prophet here. <laughs> good morning, you guys. Just want to get started. Want to welcome the three that are online. And uh, there are a couple of people I like to say welcome to. So we have Chris, who's visiting his for the first time. Let's welcome him, you guys. Welcome. If you guys come to our first service, you will see that he does our uh, ASL translations. Do you guys recognize him? Yes. yes. He'll be signing autographs and kissing babies after <laughs> our Bible study. <laughs> also, we have uh, Marty with us. Marty went with us to Israel, so let's give Marty a welcome. And uh, I think, have I missed anybody? We usually have you guys come up and sing and dance, but uh, not this time. A couple of prayer requests, you guys. Uh, you guys know uh, John Gonzalez, right? You guys know John? He comes every, he's here every uh, Tuesday morning. He helps the guys make breakfast. Uh, he had a heart attack yesterday. And uh, actually, possibly two heart attacks. And uh, Victor, him and Victor were riding bikes, were riding yesterday, and he was a little exhausted and fatigued, and I don't know how he drove home, but he had drove home and he was already drenched and couldn't move his arm. And, uh, and so I told him, you can have all the heart attacks you want, as long as you're here Wednesday to work your shift, <laughs> you're good. And so, but let's keep John in prayer and Sandra, his wife, uh, also, uh, Oscar's, uh, where's Oscar? Carmen, your sister. Carmen. Carmen, who's battling cancer, right? Mm -hmm. We want to keep her in prayer. She's going to start a, a, new, new, treatment. a new treatment. So it, it's going to start today. So you guys, let's, let's keep Carmen, let's lift up Carmen in prayer. Let's lift up John in prayer. Uh, let's lift up our whole men's ministry in prayer as uh, you see things going on. So why don't we open in prayer, you guys? Father, we thank you so much for your mercy and grace. Lord, I, I want to lift up Carmen before you, Lord, as she starts new treatment for cancer. How we, how it probably takes its toll on our bodies, Lord. And the anxiety and the fear and the just all the things that can come with it, Lord, we lift her up before you. We pray that you bring healing to her and, and we lift up the entire family before you. Lord, we lift up John Gonzalez before you, Lord, a, a brother who's faithful to our ministry, Lord. We pray that you bring healing to him. And Lord, that you would bring... Uh, peace and comfort and in this time and lord many of the guys here who are going through different things different battles i lift them up before you lord lord we love you and praise you in jesus name amen, amen. after the study uh uh andy will be here to sell conference tickets for our men's conference and uh and so i want to encourage you guys but let's turn to for, uh, second kings chapter one and want to walk um the guys who are watching online um uh, it's good to see art Art's joining us. He comes when he has his time off. Oh, and Lord, I, I want to lift up Art and his back before you, Lord. I know he's been having issues with his back. So, Lord, we lift him up before you in Jesus' name. Amen. This is, uh, as you guys see, this is the offering table. So, got some salsa here. And I want to show... Got this, you guys. So, if you want to bring your offerings to the table here... Please do. <laughs> it's a first fruits. Gregorio, thank you so much for your salsa every week. It's amazing. So thank you. So we're in 2 Kings chapter 1. And the title of this is called Odds Stacked Against You. Uh, so uh, Lord, lift up the study before you. May it bring glory and honor to your name. Amen. So I want to start with chapter uh, 1, verse 9. We'll read the first three verses and then we'll uh, get into our study. First Kings chapter, uh, excuse me, Second Kings chapter 1, starting with verse 9. Then the king sent to him a captain of 50 with his 50 men. So he went up to him, and there he was sitting on top of a hill. And he spoke to him, man of God, the king has said, come down. So Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, if I'm a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you 
and your 50 men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him with his 50. Verse 11. Then he sent to him another captain of 50 with his 50 men and answered and said to him, Man of God, thus, says the, king, thus the king has said, Come down quickly. So Elijah answered and said to them, If I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And fire, and fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Have you guys ever felt that you've been in a situation where you felt the odds were stacked against you? Maybe you faced an impossible task. If you guys are married, we know that the odds are stacked to us against us every single day, right? But maybe we're faced with a task that's in, that seems impossible. Or maybe there has been times in your life where you have felt in, uh, outnumbered in many ways. But it's in these times where we're to trust in God's word and direction from his word. So a recap of what's been going on so far. When we looked at verses 1 through 8 of, of 2 Kings chapter 1, as we're new starting this new book, we see that when we look back to 1 Kings chapter 22, it gave us a, a, a little background of King Hez, uh, Azahiah, a very wicked king, a king that sought the ways of Jeroboam, sought the ways of his father, uh, sought the ways of his mother, which is Jezebel. And so we see in chapter 22 of 1 Kings, uh, verses 52 and 53, that Azahiah was a very, very wicked king. And he brings this idol worshiping into his kingship. He continues to allow the sins of Jeroboam who introduced idolatry, who introduced the worship of different gods. He introduces, he, re, he maintains this practice of idol worshiping. His father, King Ahab, introduced the worship of Baal and Jezebel, which is, it was her God, introduced the worship of Baal and Asterisk, who is the sexual goddess. Baal was the storm god. And Ahab and Jezebel introduced this type of worship into the northern kingdom of Israel. And so it tells us that Ahab, Azahiah walked in the ways of his father, his mother, and in the sins of Jeroboam. So right off the bat, we see the result of disobedience. When you look at verse 1, of chapter one of second Kings, because it says Moab rebelled against Israel. So we see right off the bat, the, re the results of disobedience, the result and fruit of disobedience brings judgment of God's wrath. If we live a life that is in disobedience to God, disobedience to his word, disobedience to, to the Holy Spirit of, of God, then we're gonna see a life that's gonna have fruit of God's wrath. And the second thing that we see in 2 Kings, it says not only did Moab rebel against Israel, it says that Azahiah fell through the lattice of his upper room. So this king who has uh, walked in the ways of idolatry has this injury. Now injury happens to all of us, right? Injury happens to the good and the bad, the small and the great. Just because someone's injured doesn't mean that God's wrath is on you. But it was a beginning to reveal his heart. Because what happens is when we go through crisis, what we turn to during those crises is what we worship. And that's something we always have to remember that when we are going through difficult times, what we turn to during that time is what we are worshiping. If we're worshiping the true God, then we will bring our petitions and our supplications and our requests to God. But if we're turning to other things, we will bring those things to what we serve. And we see that Azahiah, through this injury, sends messengers out to inquire of Baal Zebub. Now, Baal Zebub in the Hebrew means Lord of the Flies. There's a play on words there that the writer's telling us of his disgust of a king of Israel going to such idol worshiping. The word here, when you look at chapter 
uh, 1 verse 2, it says that he fell through the lattice and that he was injured and that he said that he sent messengers to inquire or to consult, which means to worship or some act of divination to find out if I'm going to live or die. And we looked, about, we looked at obedience. You know, oftentimes we will turn to other things when we go through crisis in our lives. I joked that we go through Dr. Phil or we go to The View or we go to Oprah Winfrey. We go to a, a number of different things that we will go to when we are going through difficult times. Sometimes we go to Facebook or Instagram or TikTok and we put our stuff out there because that's where we're going to. And what's interesting about this whole thing is that the word Baal Zebel, which was the real intention of the word, means Baal is prince. But because the writer in his disgust changes the Hebrew word to Zebub, Baal Zebub, it tells that in his disgust that he's only really Lord of the Flies. What's interesting about this is that this injury that Azahiah in, in, received from falling is an interesting injury because Baal would not be called upon unless there is a disease or pestilence. Therefore, another play on words that the writer is using here, Baal Zebub would make sense because he was the god of pestilence. He was the god of dung, if that even, even, even makes sense. And he would tell these flies in ancient, hist in, in the mid ancient Middle Eastern history that he would have control of the flies and the flies he would be able to instruct to take disease away. Flies bring disease and he would instruct the flies to take diseases away. This is what makes the injury of Azahiah so interesting because the writer is, is suggesting that somehow, some way, that this injury turned into an illness or some type of disease. And he's calling on Baal Zebub to find out whether he's going to die or he's going to live. Now, what's interesting about this, you guys? He's now inquiring of this false god to see if he was going to live or die. Now, we know Psalms 115 tells us that even though they have eyes, they cannot see. Even though they have ears, they cannot hear in referencing to idols. Even though they have a mouth, they cannot utter words. And the, and the psalmist goes on to say, and those who make them are just like them, dead. They have no response. But yet we do the same thing in many ways. We think that, you know, Lord, I got this today. I, I really don't need you. I have my ways and I have the way I'm going to do it. And so I'm going to do that. I'm going to inquire of myself, God, before I inquire of you. Because you know what, Lord, sometimes... Our agendas aren't matching. So, you know, because you take a long time to answer prayer, I'm just going to walk over here and I'm going to seek it out myself. What's the difference? But what's even more interesting is that when you look in Jewish history, as Pastor David has shared with us many times about Jewish young men, is that they're steeped in God's word. From a little child, they, they memorize the first five books of the Old Testament. Their prayers are taught by their fathers and, and they're steeped in, in the first five books, which is called the Torah of the Old Testament. They know who God is. They see the great God working in the book of Exodus. They see the great God working in laws and, and ways of worship in Leviticus. They see his great works in Deuteronomy. And so this king would be steeped in the first five books of the Old Testament. So why would he turn away? I have to ask myself the same question. I was raised in the church. My, parent, my dad taught me scripture when I was young. I would go to, I carried the biggest Bible. But in my heart, I was a dead man within my heart. Even though I was raised in the church, steeped in God's word, I still turned away why? Because I thought it would be better there. And this, this, young, this young king, as he was growing up, he would have the influence of parents. Now, what's interesting about parents, you guys, 
It tells us here in 1 Kings chapter, at the last chapter of 1 Kings, last couple of verses, it says he walked in the ways of his father and in his in the ways of his mother, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Great parents, right? I mean, what a great example to follow. Ahab and Jezebel. But look, it says that he followed in their ways. The importance, men, of leading our family, leading our children, because they will walk in our ways. The influence that we have as fathers to our children and the importance of always pointing them to the worship of the Lord. Yes, they may stray away for a time, and we may, may never see on this side of heaven the return of our children, but yet the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he, was, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. What influence, men, are we leaving for our children? Are we the Ahab and Jezebel? Are we showing them worldly ways, but yet it can be mixed with Christianity? Or are we showing them that when you go through a difficult time, when we need guidance from the word, we go to the Lord. We don't turn to Baal Zebub. Are we teaching our children that? But some of us may say, but you know, it's too late. They're already set in their ways. It's never too late because it says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, tramp the, the ways of a child in the Lord. And when he is old, he will return. You know, my parents prayed for me for many years. They prayed for me for quite a long time. I never seen that side of my parents praying for me until I, until more recently when, you know, they, my parents are passed away. Uh, and, you know, one of the things about your parents passing away, especially when I was looking at my dad in the casket or when he passed away, he passed away at home and I was watching him gasp for his last breaths when he died. I'm sitting there and said, I brought shame to this man's name. He prayed for me. He would weep in tears. My mom would cry. They would weep in tears. And my aunts and uncles would tell me, you don't know how much your parents prayed. My mom never seen me be in this role here at the church. My dad never seen me in this role in the church. And I'm thinking, would they be proud? Mom and dad, it paid off. All those times you were praying for me. Look where I'm at now. It was because of your prayers. And it says when, when they are old, they will return. One day they will know. Hopefully they know now. Never give up on our children. What example are we leading them? Well, you say, I don't have children. What example are you leaving for your peers? What example are you leaving in your workplace or for your family members? What example are we leading them? It's interesting that this verse in Proverbs chapter 22 about training up a child in the way he should go and then when he is old, he will not depart from it. We don't, we're not given a time frame of when this will happen, but sometimes this will never happen in our lifetime. Remember, we'll never see the fruits of our prayers or see the, the ways that we pour into our children. You know, I try to do devotions with my children. They're young. And I kick them out all the time. It's interesting. We'll do a devotion and all of a sudden a fly will fly in and, and all of a sudden their eyes are on that fly, right? And I say, are you, are you guys even paying attention to me? Huh? I was like, get out of here. Get out of here. I get so frustrated, right? I have to be patient and train them up. How parents, men that are parents, how are we raising our children? Because it says, it's obvious here that Azahiah is following in the footsteps of his parents. His parents were idol worshipers and the son followed suit. This was convicting me. Because I get home from work and I'm tired and the Dodger game must be on. I'm going to watch the Dodgers. And my son's like, Daddy, will you play with me? He's like, again? Not realizing that this opportunity I have is not going to be very long. My window that I have to influence my children is this big. It's going to go like this. Mike, you know, look how quick Ben has grown up. Oscar, right here, your children, your boys. It's a minute. I used to think to myself, you know, when they're seven, when they're six years old, I'm going to. Six years old. Okay, when they're eight, I'm going to. They're eight years old. When, when they get to nine, I'll spend more time with them. 
Next thing you know, that's come and gone. How are we influencing our family, guys? And so we see, going back, that when Baal, when these messengers, so when, when Azahiah falls through this lattice, he wants to know if he's going to die. So he sends his messengers to Baalzebub, actually to the priest of Baalzebub. And in the middle of that, it tells us as a recap that the, the angel of the Lord came in and intercepted, uh, excuse me, angel of the Lord told Elijah, go intercept those messengers and tell them, thus says the Lord. Well, what's interesting here, the angel of the Lord, we'll see it again here uh, in verse 15, but it doesn't say an angel of the Lord, it says the angel of the Lord. As we talked about last week, there are times when Jesus, before he's in pre-incarnate, before he's in the form of flesh, makes an appearance, and it's called a Christophany or a theophany, where there's an appearance of Christ before he's in human form. We see this in Joshua when Joshua is sees somebody in this, this person that Joshua sees is standing there and he's holding a flaming sword. And Joshua says, are you for us or against us? And he says, no. <laughs> what a response. The ground you are standing on is holy ground. And Joshua recognizes who this is and worships him. So this is what we see here. But it doesn't give us a description of this, which is, I think, intentional. Because the writer's telling us, like, look, God's word's important. So I am going to send the angel, which is referencing, again, to a Christophany. It's a pre-incarnate son of God. It's not Jesus because Jesus is not in the flesh yet, but it's the second person in the Trinity. It's the son of God that comes and he presents a message. And Elijah takes this message and he interrupts this convoy that are gonna go. Now, what's interesting, you guys, about this interruption, Elijah goes and, and he tells him, look, why are you going to see Baalzebub when I, the, word, the Lord has given me a word for you to go back and tell your king that you're going to die. Well, this trip that these messengers are going are, is from Samaria to Ekron, which is about 83 miles, which is about a 20-hour walk. And Elijah gives us the message and he, and he tells him, go back. Tell your king you're going to die because... You sought the king of Ekron. You sought the god of Ekron, Baalzebub. So now, this is what God's telling me. You're going to die. So go back and tell your king, you're going to die. So they go back, and the king's like, what are you doing back so early? Well, this man told us that you're going to die. What did this man look like? Well, he had a hairy, he was hairy. Obviously, wasn't talking about me. You should see my back, you guys, maybe. <laughs> Just seeing if you guys are awake. <laughs> Why are you guys saying, ugh? I keep it nice, you guys. But what's interesting here is that the king sent out these messengers. They run into a man that's described as Harry, and they come back. See, what's interesting here is that Middle Eastern kings, if you didn't carry out their message, it meant execution. They went, this guy didn't even identify himself of who he was. He just says, thus says the Lord. Obviously, they must recognize something about him that interrupted their mission and went back to the king, knowing that if they didn't fulfill their mission of what the king told them to do, it would mean execution. So what was it about Elijah they didn't know who he was. That made him recognizable as a man of God so much that these people came against the king's orders, came back, and not only went against his orders, but told him, you're going to die. And the application that we looked at last week is, can people recognize you as a man of God? By the way you speak. By the way you respond in crisis. By the way we treat our wives, by the way we live our lives out, 
Are people able to recognize us as men of God? Because what was it about Elijah? I mean, they didn't have Instagram and Facebook back then, so they couldn't take their phone out. I was like, let me look at this guy's profile first. They didn't have that. So what set him apart to be recognized as a man of God when they didn't even know who he was? Well, first of all, what gave it away was his dress. It says that he was, a, he was dressed as a, a leather belt around his waist and he was hairy. Well, that's a clothing of a prophet because even when John the Baptist was baptizing, the priest and the, and the, and the Levites went out there and says, are you, are you Elijah the prophet? Because the way he was dressed. But when we put application to it, men, are we recognizable as men of God? Because what happens is we take a little bit of the world here and we take a little bit of Christianity here and we mix it together and we call ourselves men of God. When the world can't even distinguish if we're men of God. So what sets us apart? Is it our language? Is it way, the way we do things? Because every day, you men, Every day we are exhibiting if we are men of God or if we're men of the world. Is the world able to recognize you as a man of God? So much that these messengers went against what the king instructed them to do and went back. And not only that, gave the king saying, you're surely going to die. It says a man of God came up to meet us. How did they recognize that he was a man of God? And then it says in verse 9, then, it's a transition word. It's the word now action's going to take place. So this happened, then this is going to happen. The king is now motivated to take action. He just got word that from his messengers that he's going to die. And it was Elijah that gave him this word. Elijah has had a history with this family. It was Elijah who went up to Ahab and said, there's going to be no rain for three years. And then he goes in hiding and then comes back three years later and says, there's going to be rain and we're going to have a showdown on who the true God is. And then he takes off. And then they have this showdown with the 450 prophets of Baal that came from Ahab, the 400, uh, the one prophet, Elijah, and they have this showdown on who is God. Remember, they put the bull on the altar and they put water on it. And Elijah tells the 450 prophets of Baal, now call on your God. And they cut themselves and they dance and, and, and Elijah begins to mock them. Where's your God? Maybe he's on the toilet. Maybe he can't hear you. Call for him more. And they start cutting themselves more and more and more. And then God, and Elijah says, Lord, if you're the true God, he comes and consumes this, this sacrifice with fire. So they know who Elijah is. The report that was brought back to him was that you're going to die. He didn't like that. So we see here in verse 9 that he sent to Elijah. It says he sent to him a captain of 50 with his 50 men. So Elijah is now telling us here, it tells us that in verse 9 that he's sitting on a hill which is interesting because usually when he brought word to a king, he would go in hiding. But now he's sitting on top of a hill, relaxing. What would be the word today, man? I mean, I'm an old man. Is it chilling? What is it? Chillaxing? What is it, Tim? <laughs> chilling like a villain? I mean, I don't know what the word is today, guys. <laughs> I don't know. But he's on a mount on a hill. And what's interesting about being on a hill is that you're seen from multiple sides. So he was not in obscurity. He brought God's word, judgment, to these messengers. He is not hiding from the king. He's sitting on a hill. And Azahiah instructs a captain of 50 to take 50 men and to get him. 50. What's interesting is that it's usually a military appointment in first Samuel chapter eight, verse 12, it says he will appoint captains over thousands and captains over his fifties will set some to plow his ground and reharvest and the other to make weapons of war and equip his chariots. So what he does is he brings this 50 as a kind of like a mockery and a challenge to Elijah. 
Now, if 50 men, we have over 50 men here this morning. If you guys came after me, the odds are definitely stacked against me. And I wonder what Elijah was thinking about when he sees these 50 men. He's on a hill. He sees them. And they come to him, and, and they're under the orders of the king. And this time, the king doesn't send messengers. He sends a captain. A captain, higher ranked, is definitely going to follow through the orders of what the king is telling him. And he tells them, come down. That's what he says here in verse 9, that he was sitting on top of a hill, and he spoke to him and said, man of God, the king has said, come down. Come down because we're going to take you in front of the king and you're going to be dealt with. So come on down. This is not a suggestion. This is a command by the captain. So the odds would have seemed good for these 50 soldiers to go out and bring Elijah back, but they don't realize that the Lord is on Elijah's side. This had been plenty of men to capture one prophet. It says that he sat on top of a hill, that he was on high ground, where he had talked to the messengers, and it seems that this is intended to show that, look, I'm not hiding from you. I've given you God's word, and now I'm just going to sit here. When they're gone, the prophet takes his seat on this height, on verse 9, it says, on this top of the hill. And it's interesting here is that these 50 men come, this captain comes, and look what it references them as, man of God. He spoke to us as man of God. What's interesting here is that Elijah is identified by Azahiah in verse 8. But we see that the captain of 50 men doesn't address him as Elijah, rather as man of God. Now, some of the commentators were debating over this. Some were saying, well, it was a, a scornful, ridicule thing. Another commentator says, no, it was a sign of respect. But a man of God is referenced as a prophet. So anytime a man is referenced in the Old Testament as man of God, it's referencing to his, his, his order as a man of God, as a prophet, the office of a prophet. And so the captain here could be admitting righteousness of Elijah, but more than likely he was being scornful because of the way of his tone in telling him, come down. When I'm talking to my kids and I tell them to clean their room, I won't say, oh, daughter of mine, clean your room. I won't say that. My command is like, Annabelle, clean your room. So there, we see here what the writer's doing is a little interesting because the way that this captain is commanding Elijah to come down, he's using man of God in a more scornful way in a more disrespectful way. But it's interesting here that the man of God is a synonym for a prophet. We see it in for Shemamiah in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 22. Elijah seven times is referenced as a man of God in 1 Kings 17 and in 2 Kings, as we'll see here. And of Elisha, who we'll be introduced to next week, is also referenced as a man of God in 2 Kings but they reference him as man of God. Now, what's wrong with this? We may ask, I mean, I spent time looking at this, thinking, okay, what's wrong with being called man of God? Because we look in the next verse, Elijah commands, if I'm a man of God, then fire come down. And he turns him, this is, you guys, the first cases of chicharrones in the Bible. <laughs> Because fire came down and scorched them. So I started thinking, okay, why is he referencing? I, I didn't understand why it's, he's referenced man of God. And then Elijah says, well, if I'm a man of God in verse 10, then let fire come down and consume you and your 50 men. And fire came down and, from heaven and consumed him and his 50. So I struggled. What was this? But I want to develop this here for a moment with you guys. The Bible clearly teaches that we are to submit to government and to governing authorities, right? When we look at Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 2, it says, Let every soul be subject to the governing of authorities, for there is a nor no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority 
resist the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So as Christians, we are instructed to respect authority. We're to submit to that, to those who are above us, the government, the governing authorities. But at the same time, if this authority is going directly against the Lord, and it goes directly of our our moral convictions as a Christian, we are not to submit to that. Because in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. So we may be faced in a situation, maybe it's at work, where you know things are going on that are not right, but yet we go along with it and we call ourselves Christians how does that work? Or we're referenced as a man of God, but yet we're involved in things that are of the world. How does that work? See, their response to governing authorities in Acts chapter 5 was, look, we're preaching a gospel that carries a whole authority that is higher than any governing authority here. So we're going to continue to preach the gospel of God. This captain is an Israelite. This captain is Jewish because he comes from as a highest military court. So he would know what man of God meant. He would know what a prophet of a God is, but yet he's carrying out instructions to follow what the king wants, which is obviously steeped in idolatry. And the problem here is that this captain of 50 men is coming and he's addressing uh, uh, Elijah as a man of God when his tell him to come down and face my king because my king is greater than your God. So come down, Elijah, because I'm going to take you to the king that has true reign, the king that has true power, and I'm going to bring you before him because he's going to judge you. And Elijah says, if I'm really a man of God, you won't even be doing what you're doing. And if I'm a man of God, let judgment fall upon you. Let fire come down and consume you. And we see that's what happens. See, this captain, knowing who the true God of Israel is, should have resisted the ungodly and immoral command from King Ezekiah and obeyed God instead. But yet, the 50 men should have refused to obey the ungodly and immoral command of their captain. See, men, we're going to be facing situations where the world may be telling us, it could be a job, it can be anything, is telling us you have to do this. But we say, no, I serve a king and a God that is higher than this. I cannot go into this area. And, the king, and, the, and they'll say, well, who are you going to choose to serve then? I hope we don't turn to Baal. I hope we turn to the Lord. And men, we're facing situations like this all the time. See, men, the importance of obedience to the Lord and to his word See, what's interesting today, men, is what has crept into the church today is this pseudo-obedience. It's this half-hearted obedience to the Lord. You know, I hear this. You know, because I wear a cross around my neck, I'm a Christian. What does a cross mean? I don't know. But I just wear this big cross. And, and because of this, yes, I'm a Christian. I was at a, I was at a restaurant, and, and the waitress was wearing a cross. And I said, oh, you're a Christian? So, oh, yeah. I said, what church do you go to? Uh, she's not like, what church do you go to? I was like, oh, cool, what church do you go to? Oh, I don't go to church. Uh, I pray every day. Oh, cool. But she called herself a Christian. Where's the obedience to God's word? Where's the obedience in, in, in prayer? Or because I have not of this world sticker on my car, I'm a Christian. Yeah, because I, I have the sticker on the back of my bumper. Yeah, I, I'm a Christian. But when it comes to living and submitting to the authority of God's word, don't judge me, brother. Don't judge me. 
When it comes to living a life surrendered wholly to Jesus, you know what? There are too many rules. I, I can't do this. I, I can't have any fun. But yet they go on confessing that they're Christians, but continue in living in ungodly and immoral ways. And this is what the captain of 50 was doing. He was under a king who was worshiping Baal. He's instructed by the king to take this message and bring this prophet of God. Do you see the immoral and godly? This is why fire came down. The Pharisees are a great example of this. And Jesus has harsh words for them in Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 and 28. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, what look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside they're full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but in the inside you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. And the, com the king commands them, this captain says, Come down. The king wants to deal with you. And Elijah says in verse 10, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down and consume you. Was it Elijah that called the fire down? No, it was God from heaven bringing judgment. By sending fire from heaven to consume the soldiers, God was reminding Azahiah that he was in control of all things and that the king should submit to his sovereignty. What's interesting is Elijah said, oh yeah, you bet. You bet I'm a man of God. You better recognize. And I think that's what's crept into, the, into like leadership today. I want you to recognize that I'm a man of God. Not in a way that Elijah was recognized, but in ways that we puff ourselves up. Elijah said, you say I'm a man of God, even though you're not acting like it. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. Let God decide by fire. But we see that Elijah didn't buy into the fame of man of God, come down. <laughs> yeah, I am a man of God. You got that right. You better recognize. And you know what? I'm important, so roll out the red carpet for me. I want you to, yeah, I'll come down, but I want you to have this for me, and I want you to have that for me. And we can get so caught up in titles, and our hearts can become so proud, and we begin to expect people to give a special treatment in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus describes what is the greatest in the kingdom. And he references as a man, uh, references as a child. He says, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So we see in verse 11, you guys are going to hurry through this or we might have to pick it up next week. So in verse 11, it says that the king sends another 50 men and a captain and he answered and said to him, man of God, thus the king has said, come down quickly. It's, different, it's a different command than last time. Last time he said, come down. Now he says, you know what? You better come down quickly. And Elijah says in verse 12, and said to him, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And fire of God came down. From heaven and consumed him with this 50. Didn't you think that first captain would have learned? But isn't that like us, a lot of ways, men, that we will continue in those ways? Men, we've been called to be set apart from the Lord. We've been called to obedience to God's word. How much time are we spending in his word? Because there will be a time, men, where our faith is going to be put to the test. And will we go and call a man of God when we know that who we're submitting our authority, our hearts to, is not of God? And yet, we pretend we're men of God? We have to live a life that is set apart in holiness for God. It doesn't mean walking on water. It means living a life that's obedient to God. What's our obedience quotient look like this morning? We measure intelligence. We have an intelligence quotient, right? I think mine's on the lower end of the spectrum. But what's our obedience quotient look like? How much time are you spending in God's word every day? How much time are you spending in prayer? See, these men, these captains, the king himself, 
are Israelis. They know the Torah. They know who the, who the God of Israel is. But yet they've been caught up with the world. They've been caught up with the cool things. They've been caught up in things that has turned their obedience into idols. And men, we can set up idols in our lives so easily. It won't look like Baal, but it might be money. It might be titles. It might be recognition. It might be women. It might be, and you fill in the blank. Are we turning our hearts to them? Because men, when we, what we turn our hearts to is what we're worshiping. May we be men of obedience in God's word, especially in today's world, you guys. The world is looking for men that are set apart from God, not somebody who's faking the funk and living the vida loca and has one foot in the world and one foot serving the Lord. No, Jesus says, I will spit you out of my mouth. We need to be sold out for the gospel, especially in today's world. God has raised us up, men, all of us, for such a time as this. May we be obedient in God's word. Next week, we'll pick it up here and we'll continue uh, and we'll uh, move forward. Uh, but hope this made sense, you guys, because this first of all spoke to me that I need to be obedient. I could get so caught up in ministry that my obedience quotient is low. We have to stand fast, especially for today. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, may we learn from this that obedience to you is first and foremost. It's not turning to other things, Lord. It's turning to you, to your word, hearing from your word, hearing from your spirit, Lord. And we've allowed busyness to get in the way to hearing from you, Lord. We have allowed so much noise to come into our hearts, Lord, that we can't even recognize your voice. May we be set apart that live that we live a life that is for you, Lord, and that we're recognized as a man of God, that we don't submit to the things that are ungodly or immoral, Lord, and yet try to call ourselves men of God. That doesn't work. May we be obedient to you. So, Lord, I ask that this word is an encouragement to all of us. And, Lord, that now that we break bread together, may we have sweet fellowship. So, Lord, again, we lift up Carmen before you, Lord, we lift up John Gonzalez before you. I lift up my brother Art before you, Lord. And the many requests that are here, we lift up before you. So Lord, may we go and live today, Lord, today in obedience for you. And then tomorrow in obedience to you. And the next day in obedience to you. So Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks you guys for tuning in. Thanks you guys for tuning in. Andy's in the back for uh, uh, men's conference tickets. If you guys want to buy me a steak breakfast, I, uh, praise God. I'm teasing you guys. <laughs> <laughs>